I'm Joy Ditto, President and CEO of the American Public Power Association, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of Public Power Conversations. Supply chain issues are complex, and believe it or not, they existed long before 2022. But as supply chain disruptions contribute to delayed deliveries and increased costs, many consumers are frustrated right now. Fertilizer and baby formula shortages have captured the attention of lawmakers and the public, but another maybe lesser known threat is on the list of endangered goods and services, which is reliable power. Transformers are made of steel imported from countries like China and Russia. The COVID-19 pandemic, the Ukraine invasion have affected steel production, which has increased lead times on electric transformers from three to six months to more than a year for delivery. Low stockpiles of electric transformers could lead to problems restoring power in the wake of summer storms, for example, and the lack of other grid components, including smart meters, is stalling economic growth. Here to discuss this important issue and how it can affect public power communities is Gary Gibson. Gary is the general manager of City Utilities of Springfield, Missouri. He became general manager in 2019 after 28 years with the utility. City Utilities of Springfield serves electricity, natural gas, water, broadband, and public transportation services to the Springfield community. Thank you so much for joining us today, Gary. Hi, Joy. Great to see you. Great to see you as well. Um, so I have some questions to guide the conversation, but we can we can wander off wherever it takes us. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, so uh, how are supply chain issues like transformer shortages affecting your utility in Missouri? Well, you really hit it at a macro level. You know, we're seeing increased cost and we're seeing much, much longer lead times. You know, from a cost standpoint, it's not going to be surprised to see uh, the the increases that we've seen. If you take our 20 most common transformers that we use, on average from 2019, we've seen a little over 250% increase in cost. Single transformers, we've seen up to 800% increase in cost. And even if you get outside the transformer arena and, and look at the poles and, and the most common items that we have in, on the, in the storeroom, uh, you know, we're seeing an average of about a, a 55 to 60% increased cost just over the last two years. But cost aside, it's the lead times that really concern me. Uh, it, you know, and as you said, you know, this started before the last several months, but it, it's been with us, but it has definitely got worse over 2022. Uh, you know, it's caused us to do things different. We have our transformers all ordered and, and we think we're good for 2022, but we put our orders in for 2023 and, and 2024 and, you know, with no real confidence that those are going to come through when we need them. So it has caused us to, to do some things like prioritize the buckets that we put our transformers in and, and do some transformer rationing. For instance, you know, the first thing we have to prioritize is having enough transformers on hand for storm restoration. Uh, after that, you know, the most important thing for us is, is new customer work because we never want to tell a new customer that we can't hook them up and we can't meet their project. And then we have to be ready for, you know, there's a lot of ARPA dollars out there. So there's going to be a lot of public improvements like road improvements. So we have to have materials around to, to make sure that we can do those relocations when they come up. So really it makes the last bucket be our preventative maintenance. And, and so, you know, we hate getting behind on preventative maintenance, but that's really what you have to do to make sure you have enough materials for everything else. Uh, And so that's caused our purchasing folks to be very creative. You know, they've faced challenges, not just from a supply chain, but the workforce side too, because salespeople that they've been used to working with for years have moved on. They're dealing with new people that don't have that industry knowledge. They don't have the knowledge of city utilities that they might have. They're not real good at communicating and get back to you. Uh, And and quite frankly, some of our suppliers aren't getting uh, good information from their suppliers. So that makes it difficult to plan. Uh, uh, we've had to do a lot of things different, not just in the electric side, but the gas and water side as well. You know, several years ago, we could start a project knowing that we were going to have the materials come in in time to keep the contractors working, to keep our crews working. Now we pretty much have to wait and make sure all the materials are here before we start, just so that we don't uh, unduly impact our customers or or have a project where we have to have a contractor go off because that's going to be extra cost for us and, and annoyance for the contractor. Uh, so just a lot of different challenges that you know not only us at City Utilities are facing, but that we're all facing. That's, I mean, it's just, it's, 
challenging and daunting, but I uh, appreciate, you know, kind of the, the deeper dive into what you're facing. And from what I've heard from across the country for public power, from public power, utility, general managers, your situation is not unique, unfortunately. And that kind of goes into my next question, which is when we see major events, I know you, you alluded to storm restoration in Missouri, and certainly you all get hit by, you know, big, you know, summer storms, winter storms, even tornadoes. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, not hurricanes. And, you know, I know we're in hurricane season right now as we record this. So what could this maybe mean for um, other storm prone regions where you might potentially send crews or equipment um, to restore after a hurricane? Kind of how do you see that playing out um, in places like Florida, Louisiana, Texas? You know, and, and those kind of used to be regional events. So we kind of knew that, you know, hey, in April and May, we're going to have tornadoes in the Midwest and then hurricane season is going to start in June. Uh, and we kind of plan for those. Well, well, now we know that, you know, transformers that we may have ordered and, and we think have been shipped to, to Springfield, Missouri, uh, you know, if a hurricane comes on, they're going to get reprioritized and rightly so to, to other providers. Uh, but that's just going to make the problem worse. So uh, we were fortunate in, in the Midwest to kind of have a wider uh, tornado season, but we know it's predicted to be a, a stronger hurricane season this year. So I think that's just going to exacerbate the problem. And kind of what feels really weird to me, you know, having been in this industry for the last 30 years, is uh, we're all just built to help each other and to help our customers. One thing that we frequently have done in the past, you know, if customers, uh, if they provide their own transformers and they have something go bad or if, or if a neighbor has uh, a material issue, you know, we've always been right there to, to loan other people materials. Well, now you kind of pause and think if that's the right thing to do or if you need to hold things back for, for city utilities. And, and that just feels a little bit wrong when you, when you make those decisions uh, because that's just the way we're built to help each other out. So as we go into the, the, the you know, hurricane season and, and then other events throughout the year, it's just gonna make this problem even worse until we can really get the whole supply chain uh, situation taken care of. And it's not just the raw materials, but it's also the transportation side of it. Uh, we've got a project to rebuild one of our transformer distribution trans, uh, substations in town. So we have a couple uh, transformers ordered uh, coming from Argentina and uh, you know they've been built and they've been ready to be shipped, but those ships uh, are hauling wheat uh, to Europe because of the war in Ukraine. So even though they've been manufactured, just the transportation piece to get them to Springfield is going to be an issue. So it's not just regional storms, but it's the whole uh, socioeconomic uh, landscape of the world that we have to face today. You know what, that's actually a really great point. And it, it feels a little bit like a, ga a game of whack-a-mole or you kind of push on one thing, you pull on another, which I think is is the complexity of supply chain that, that many of us just don't even think about. I mean, let's face it. And, and you know, even sometimes our government um, doesn't completely understand what, you know, what that means on the ground. So that was a great example of something you wouldn't have even thought of impacting our, our shipment of transformer, your yeah. shipment of transformer. So, um, you know, what maybe gearing this next question toward lawmakers, what do you want them to know about this issue and, and what solutions do you think could be implemented to help mitigate, mitigate this crisis? Well, you know, when I talk to, to our legislators, you know, one of the first things that, that I urge them, number one, is just to understand how critical our industry is. Uh, you know, that was demonstrated, you know, very well last February during Winter Storm Uri to see when people don't have power, what that means, you know, even from a life safety standpoint. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes in Washington, D.C., there, there are very short memories, uh, but we need to make sure we keep telling that story. But when I talk to our legislators, we have a great opportunity here with Build Back Better and with ARPA to get dollars in to improve our systems and to just improve the, the infrastructure in the communities that we serve. But the message that I've been giving is we have to have longer than 2026 to spend that money. If we want to take the best advantage of our tax dollars uh, that we all pay and, and make sure they go as far as they can. We want to make sure that we're just not driving inflationary pressures up and all competing for those same resources, you know, whether it's materials or, or labor. Uh, so give us time to extend that. Uh, we also want to make sure that, you know, there's if, if there are federally funded projects that have uh, Buy America provisions and things like that, that we may need some relief from those. 
uh, just so that we can use some common sense and make sure we get the materials that we need. You guys have done a great job, you know, communicating that message as well. Uh, as we've ratcheted up transformer efficiency standards over time, you know, maybe we need to relax those for a short period of time until we get past these obstacles. Uh, and then lastly, just make sure they know the importance of everything that we do. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And yeah, I mean, we have, as you kind of mentioned, we, we have been assessing at, at APPA what could be done um, or what we could ask for that might have an impact. And you, you mentioned the transformer efficiency standard, you know, from a on a temporary basis, to your point, relaxing that could help. Um, you know, there are maybe some other things that we haven't thought of yet that could help. Um, we are still kind of fully analyzing the um, the Biden administration's as we as we film this, the Biden administration's recent actions on um, using Defense Production Act, particularly for solar equipment. But there is a mention of of other electrical equipment like transformers. We believe that's a positive development from the standpoint of of the um, administration taking notice that there is a concern. Uh, and we are, you know, still kind of sussing out what the use of the Defense Production Act can mean. But at least there is, a, I think, awareness now at the highest levels of government that this is a, a big concern for us and could have unintended consequences if we don't try to wrap our arms around this. And one other thing I've just mentioned before going to the next question is we do work with the, the Department of Energy and the rest of the electric sector on some of these matters through a coordinating council um, approach. And we are, we have, uh, we're about to stand up a, a group called the Tiger Team to look at these issues, to try to bring in some of the manufacturing community and maybe see, I mean, are there some labor issues we could help with as an industry, for example? I mean, just thinking outside the box, what, what are some of the things maybe the manufacturers need that we could potentially help with to try to alleviate some of this pressure. Um, so look forward to work by that group and we'll be reporting out on it um, to the membership as we move forward. Um, so wanted to just kind of note that in the vein of, of that interface with the federal government and education and activity, but none of this is like, there's no magic wand here, right? And so right. That's, the, that's the issue. I think so many of the things that we do, we just have to kind of keep plugging and trying to, um, get the job done and try to identify some of these places where we can be helpful. And, so, you know, those tiger um, teams identifying some of those critical industries, you know, one that comes to mind for me are chip manufacturers, uh, really? you know, well, not directly in transformers, but, you know, we're, we're in the same situation as a, a lot of other providers. You know, we've ordered line trucks that, you know, we don't expect to see till 2023 or 2024 at the soonest. And, and if we can identify what some of those really critical industries are through those tiger teams and then right. see if we can get some help through the Defense Powers Act and or what other ways that the, the folks in DC can help us out with that is just going to be critical because I love the way you described it as whack-a-mole. That's really kind of what I feel like we're in today is, you know, we've got to hit every front that we can because uh, we'll get through this, uh, you know, depending on the way swings, but it's going to be with us for the next several years and, and we're going to have to work together. And that's why I'm so glad we have people like you and your team helping us out with this issue. Thank you very much, Gary. Well, so I just have a couple more questions. Um, uh, and, and I think this, we kind of already started down this path, which is the electric utility industry, including public power, is an industry of problem solvers. So, you know, we know that that's, that we'll get the, these problems solved if we put our minds to it and, and partner well. I mean, it could be slightly painful, though. And I, you also talked about the affordability piece. Um, so how, given all of those dynamics, how are you, you communicating uh, about this issue with your customers or have you done so yet? You know, so it, it's got to be a message on multiple fronts. You know, we, we talk frequently uh, to, to our board, every board meeting we've talked uh, over the last year, it seems like we've talked about supply chain. Uh, we've got a citizen, the citizen's advisory council that we talk to a lot about these issues. Uh, but we've really targeted groups like the local Springfield Contractors Association and the Home Builders Association just to make sure they know what the issues are and to make sure the earlier they can give us information about a project and we can get prepared, get things on order, uh, hopefully well ahead of time so we don't slow their projects down. And then also try to find solutions. You know, we've had a recent load, about a 10 megawatt load that came on our system and we just said, okay, we're not gonna be able to have the transformers for you. Uh, in that case, they, they were able to have some access somewhere else to some transformers and we can primary meter them. 
and you know just got to kind of work to find those best solutions. Our, our residential customers, it really is the cost uh, component and then the reliability component to just make sure that they know we're doing everything we can and working with industry associations like APPA to make sure we stay on top of this problem. So if an issue does come up that we can make sure uh, we maintain service. Uh, fortunately, we you know, talked to a lot of my peers who are out harvesting transformers and we've talked about that too. Uh, you know, if we've got some aerial storage out there where transformers aren't being fully utilized and, and we can repurpose those, those are important. But making sure you tell the message so they're not surprised. I never like to surprise my bosses and all of my neighbors are my bosses. So we want to make sure uh, at least they know that there's an issue out there and that we're uh, actively looking at how we can take care of that. That's a, that's a great point. Don't surprise. I don't like to surprise my members either. <laughs> so I hear you. Um, so what, you know, on that vein, I did I did want to make a plug quickly that APPA, um, in thinking through how we might help solve at least a small part of this issue, we have created a feature on our one of our existing platforms, which is our e-reliability tracker. And it's just a it's a system whereby people can track their reliability specifications and, and uh, data um, over time. And we've created an element to that existing platform to enable utilities to plug in their transformer needs, voltage classes, things like that. And then we can kind of do a match.com um, type of approach with utilities who have included their information. Uh, so we just rolled that out relatively recently. We were able to put that feature on. Of course, it's a free service um, to all of our members. And we were even trying to entice some others in the sector to join the the platform so that we can get a great sense of what's really out there across the country. So my hope is that we'll continue to build this platform up so that it's helpful to everyone, including city utilities and everyone in Missouri. So just wanted to plug that for a second um, and look forward to continuing to build that, again, that capacity out as we go forward. Yeah, that's a great effort. I really appreciate it. We're, gonna, we're all gonna have to work together as we get through this. Awesome. Um, okay, so my last question is, you know, how can the industry band together even more so than we already are to explain this issue to the public, you know, without maybe creating panic or, you know, uh, kind of a crying wolf mentality? What, what do you think we can do there um, as we speak more generally to the public and in the media? You know, that's an interesting question. I wish I had the silver bullet on how we do that. Uh, you know, it seems like memories are short, probably because we do such a really good job keeping the lights on. Uh, you know, I go back, I mentioned Winter Storm Uri before, uh, you know, people get a lot of attention in our industry when the power is not there, uh, but we get it restored and it seems like uh, that's a, a memory that, that fades pretty quickly. And we don't want to create a panic like there's an imminent danger uh, of you know losing reliability or having rolling blackouts. Uh, but I think our neighbors and our owners can be our best advocates. So we just need to make sure that we continue to tell the, the, the story of public power, you know, how local community ownership uh, gives them a little bit more power in that equation and how, you know, they can help guide us through that as well. But they can also, when, when they're talking to our legislators and lawmakers, they can, they can advocate for that too and say, you know, we want to make sure we know we have reliable power in Springfield. We have affordable power in Springfield. It's important that we keep that. And at least legislators know how important it is for them. So uh, we have to keep telling the story and we have to do it in a way where we don't scare people, but I think we talk about our great history in the past and, and how we continue to work together in efforts like you just described uh, to make sure that we continue our, our great history of reliability and affordability for, for all of our neighbors. All right, well, thank you so much, Gary. Uh, That's a great way to end and, and appreciate you shedding some light on this very important topic that has quickly risen to the top of our priority list here at APPA. Um, so again, appreciate having you on. Thanks for coming. And I look forward to seeing you at our national conference soon. Again, I know this may not come out till after the national conference, but look forward to seeing you in Nashville in, a, in a, just a few days. And again, thanks for coming on. Great. I look forward to a great conference coming up and seeing everybody in person again. Thank you.